for a tough new security law in Hong Kong. This is a major move to practice one country, two systems, and is also in line with China's constitution and the basic law of Hong Kong. The number of people who've died with COVID-19 in the United States has now passed 100,000. South Korea is reimposing some social restrictions in its main cities to combat a small spike in coronavirus cases. And Nissan has announced the closure of its factory in Barcelona with the loss of almost 3,000 jobs. However, its Sunderland production plant in the UK will remain open. Hello and welcome to audiences in the UK and around the world. We're covering all the latest coronavirus developments here in Britain and globally. I'm Anita McVeigh. First, new coronavirus test and trace systems have gone live in England and Scotland this morning. In an attempt to keep infection outbreaks contained, anyone who's been in close contact with someone who has tested positive will now be contacted and asked to self-isolate. The UK government has said the English system will change people's lives. Scientists think it could prevent between 5 and 15 percent of cases. Northern Ireland has its own version of the programme already up and running. And in Wales, their scheme is due to start in early June. Meanwhile, in the United States, more than 100,000 people have now died from COVID-19. Apologies, I should, of course, say 100,000. That's the figure there. That's more than the combined total of American fatalities from the Korean, Vietnam and Iraq wars. South Korea is reintroducing tougher social distancing measures after officials there recorded a fresh spike in coronavirus infections. 79 new cases were identified on Thursday. That's the highest daily figure for nearly two months. First, with this report on the test and trace system being rolled out in parts of the UK, here's Charlotte Rose. We've all got used to the slogans and rules for tackling COVID-19, but from today, there's a further today, change as parts of the UK move into the test and trace phase. The aim is to start to ease the nationwide lockdown and only bring it back in places where there's an outbreak. So how will test and trace work in England? If you get symptoms, a high fever, persistent cough or loss of taste and smell, you must self-isolate and order a test. If you test positive, the contact tracer will identify people who you've been close enough to pass the virus to. Those contacts will be classed as either low or high risk. Contact tracers will then get in touch with people who might be at risk. They'll be asked to isolate for 14 days or get tested themselves if they develop symptoms. You might remember an app which was being trialled on the Isle of Wight. That's not yet ready to be launched across England, so it's not part of government plans. The new system will be dependent on people following the rules around self-isolation. If you are contacted by NHS Test and Trace instructing you to isolate, you must. It is your civic duty. So you avoid unknowingly spreading the virus and you help to break the chain of transmission. But some remain cautious about how well the new system will cope. You absolutely need rapid test turnaround. The international standard is you should get the test results back within 24 hours. There are far too many places uh, in terms of our trusts, but also care homes, the trust that we represent, but in terms of care homes who are saying they can't get results back uh, uh, any quicker than, for example, an average of three to five days. Later today, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon is set to announce plans for an easing in lockdown measures. The First Minister's already announced plans for a Scottish test and protect system. Northern Ireland has already launched its tracing system and Wales is set to follow next week. It comes as a further 412 people died with coronavirus yesterday, taking the total number of deaths to 37,460. 117,013 tests were done yesterday, with 2,013 people testing positive. Those people living in England will be the first to be contacted today as the new system launches. 
The government hopes these new measures will start to allow the economic and social recovery from the virus. Charlotte Rose, BBC News. And our health correspondent Catherine Burns is here with me now. Uh, hello to you, Catherine. So the test and trace getting underway today in England and Scotland. Unfortunately, um, news of some teething problems already. Yeah, we've heard from a contact tracer who's tried to log onto the system and just can't do it this morning. So maybe, to be fair, there's 25,000 of them all trying to log on at the same time. So we'll see what happens there. But essentially, 25,000 tracers right now are starting in the last hour to make those calls, texts and emails to around 2,000 people who tested positive yesterday. OK, so that's how it works. They'll essentially be trying to deal on a given day with the cases of people who've tested positive the previous day, get lots of information from them. Um, it depends, of course, as we've already been discussing so far today, on people wanting to be completely open and feeling safe to be completely honest about you know, where they've been, um, what they've been doing, even if that perhaps wasn't keeping to a social distance. Yeah, you think about it. We're trying to break the chains of trans transmission here, but every chain relies on its weakest link. So there's a few things here. The tests need to come through quickly. The new target is 24 hours. I had one on Monday, didn't get it till last night. So that's one thing to think about. The tests need to come through quickly. The second thing is people need to be honest. They need to say what they've done, who they've seen, and then those further contacts need to all agree to self-isolate. Now, one way to see this is, this is a way to sort of open up the country for most people, for the many, but at the same time, it will be toughening things for the few who seem to be at risk here. OK, yes, so some people will be asked to, you know, take further measures, further steps to, to lock themselves down for the greater good. Um, so say you get a call and you're told that you've been in contact with someone who does have the virus, you say, oh, actually, I had the virus weeks ago, I I'm fine. I mean, I is that the case? Tough luck. <laughs> it doesn't matter at this stage. Matt Hancock's been on today talking about this, saying, you know, he's someone who's had it, he would be very interested in that personally. It doesn't matter if you get the call, because we don't know how long immunity lasts for, what kind of immunity we have at this stage. If you get a call saying you've been in contact with someone, you have to go into isolation for two weeks. What about the members of your household, the same? No, unless you or someone in the house starts to develop symptoms. So this isn't just staying at home, it's isolating at home. It's not lockdown as we know it. It's a sort of step up from that. OK, so that's really important to emphasise. Not stay at home, but isolate at yes. home. I think that bears repetition, Catherine. Yeah, absolutely. You essentially need to behave as if you have the virus for those two weeks. So, until you know otherwise. So, let's say you're perfectly well, you get a call and someone says, you know, go into isolation. You may feel perfectly well, but you have to behave as if you have it. So, that's staying away from your family. If you then start to feel ill, then you can go and get tested and have a certain answer. But until, until you know otherwise, you behave as if you have it. OK, Catherine, thank you very much for that. Catherine Burns, our health correspondent. Now, ministers will meet their scientific advisers today to finalise plans for the next phase of easing the lockdown in England. The measures are reviewed every three weeks. An announcement is expected at today's Downing Street news briefing. Let's talk to our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, at Westminster. Norman, first of all, uh, as Catherine was saying, this test and trace system depends on a, on a few things. It depends on people being absolutely open and honest with the contact tracers. It depends on those tests getting turned around really quickly. What's the government saying about its capacity um, to, to get in touch with people and, indeed, uh, to, uh, you know, to get those test results turned around really quickly? Well, at the moment, they're talking a good game on the uh, test and trace system. They said they've got around 25,000 people uh, ready to trace people. Um, that's more than enough, they believe, to make the system operate. In terms of the tests, yes. There are still an awful lot of tests that take quite a bit longer than 24 hours. They've not set a date on getting to the 24-hour test, but that is certainly their aspiration. And in terms of people complying with these uh, new rules, they remain hopeful, hopeful because by and large, throughout this whole lockdown process, people have been a good deal more compliant uh, than ministers had hoped for. Added to which, I think significantly, the new system is going to be relatively light touch to start with. There's going to be no fines, no checking up. You're not going to have bobbies battering on the door demanding to know whether you're self-isolating. It's pretty much going to be left to individuals to go along with it. And, crucially, it's going to be fronted by the NHS. It's not going to be the government ordering you to do things. It's going to be clinicians 
asking you to do things. So there is a hope that that softly, softly approach will land better with the public and people will be more ready to go along with that before you move to the next stage when the app is rolled out in the middle of June. But it is, as Matt Hancock was saying this morning, in the end going to depend on people doing, as he puts it, their civic duty. All of this is about doing the very best that we can. Not only my team, the people who are working in NHS Test and Trace, but also all of us who are participating, those who test positive and those who are contacts and so get the uh, get the communication from NHS Test and Trace that they need to self-isolate. If everybody does our best, then we will get that uh, rate of transmission down and we'll break the, ra break the, the chain of transmission from the virus more often. I suppose, too, in the real world, the hope is that for many people, reporting on who they've come into contact will also be, to some extent, in the interests of their family and friends, because by and large, the people you come into closest contact with are your nearest and dearest. And so there is a hope that people, because they want to protect their family and their friends, will be quite determined to make sure those people do self-isolate and do look after themselves. So. At the moment, I think they are broadly optimistic that people, even though these are entirely new restrictions, will be ready to go along with them. OK, Norman, thank you very much for that. Norman Smith at Westminster. Members of the Chinese legislature, the National People's Congress, have overwhelmingly endorsed sweeping and controversial new security laws for Hong Kong. The bill, which now passes to China's senior leadership, has caused deep concern among those who say it could end Hong Kong's unique status. Here's a look at what the law will do. Firstly, it will criminalise conduct in Hong Kong that harms national security, a measure pro-democracy campaigners fear could be used to target them. It permits China's national intelligence agencies to set up offices in Hong Kong to oversee its enforcement. Beijing will also be able to place the measure into the basic law, that's the mini-constitution on how Hong Kong is run, effectively bypassing the territory's own lawmakers. Li Zhanzhou, a member of the Chinese Communist Party's Standing Committee, welcomed the law at the closing ceremony of the National People's Congress. This meeting deliberates and approves a draft decision of the National People's Congress for establishing a legal system and enforcement mechanism for Hong Kong to safeguard national security. This is a major move to practice one country, two systems, and is also in line with China's constitution and the basic law of Hong Kong. It also aligns with the fundamental interests of people in mainland China, as well as Hong Kong residents. Well, our correspondent Stephen McDonald said it was no surprise the National People's Congress overwhelmingly approved the legislation. Look, it's a rubber stamp session. There was never going to be any resisting this at the National People's Congress. But even so, 2,787 in favour and only one against, uh, with six abstentions, it is quite something. Uh, however, what it means, though, is that this bill now goes to the next stage, which is that the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress works out the details of the law and writes it up and it could actually uh, well come into effect before the end of the year now what's not clear is exactly what types of speech or exactly what actions might constitute treason under this new law there are some concerns that even calling for hong kong independence could be seen as secession so these crimes like treason or secession they are serious and at the moment people are being charged, activists, with rioting and assembly, uh, uh, you know, charges. And to tell the truth, not that many people have actually been punished under that process, although 7,000, more than 7,000, have been charged over the last year. Under this new law, well, the, these crimes like trees, and that can mean decades in prison, and so this is why there's been a lot of concern in Hong Kong uh, amongst the pro-democracy camp that it could be eroding the city's freedoms. Now, of course, those who defend the bill, though, would say that the protests have gone too far, they've been too destructive, uh, and something had to be done to try and rein in this movement. 
Stephen McDonnell, uh, let's uh, cross live now to Hong Kong and speak to our correspondent, Martin Yip. Uh, Martin, tell us more about the reaction of those pro-democracy uh, protesters uh, to what's been happening at the National People's Congress. Uh, do they feel now that their efforts over the last year or so uh, have been in vain to some extent? Do they feel that Hong Kong's status is changing permanently? Well, the answer to this question would, would actually be something that we still have to wait to see. The reason I'm saying so is that we, we've seen a rather um, uh, violence clashes in the past uh, couple of days and over the past weekend, literally after this bill in Beijing was announced uh, in the previous weekend. But then uh, they've been sort of venting their anger already. Uh, they've been talking about this, uh, what you just mentioned, uh, the, the demise of, uh, uh, of um, prosperity in Hong Kong as well as a one country, two system. Uh, but the, ch the game changer probably would be uh, developments in the United States as well. You, you have the Secretary of, uh, of State, uh, Pompeo, uh, reporting to the Congress that they are not seeing Hong Kong as having autonomy anymore. And that might trigger some sort of uh, response, at least from Washington, D.C., uh, and that would be more diplomatic confrontation between Beijing and Washington, which end up with some people in some sort of speculation at this stage. But that doesn't mean they are not angry at all, and that's why we saw what we saw yesterday, the clashes in the street between uh, the protesters and uh, the uh, and riot police, uh, while also at the same time we have uh, uh, other groups uh, voicing concern just after this law has been passed, like uh, what, I, what I'm just reading this report from what, uh, the local broadcaster RTHK, is the uh, people from the arts industry voicing concern on this very piece of law to be imposed by Beijing. Uh, they are raising uh, scenarios like if somebody goes to a concert and somebody sang a song that bears uh, lyrics that are seen as subversive, would those audience, uh, members of audience being ended up ch uh, being charged with the same charge? So there's so many questions to be answered uh, from Beijing, from the Hong Kong government uh, to satisfy people's worries. OK, Martin, thank you very much. Martin Yip in Hong Kong. The headlines now on BBC News. Uh, test and trace systems get underway in England and Scotland today as part of a more targeted approach to tackling coronavirus. Beijing overwhelmingly endorses a hugely controversial bill that paves the way for a tough new security law in Hong Kong. And the number of people who've died from COVID-19 in the United States has now passed 100,000. And uh, staying with that story, as we've just been telling you, the coronavirus pandemic has claimed now more than 100,000 lives in America over the past four months. It's the highest total of any country in the world. Our North America correspondent Ali Makbu has been speaking to some of the families who have lost loved ones. Happy birthday to you. Friends and relatives of more than 100,000 people in America can now just cling to the memories of happier times before the coronavirus. You know, my father was a really caring person and he just wanted to help people. Um, and he was really outgoing. You know, he thought he was really funny. <laughs> Doug Lambrecht was one of the first confirmed deaths back on the 1st of March. As somebody who lost someone so close to them and who was obviously very, very dear to you so early on, when you saw the way this was going in the country, how has it made you feel over the last couple of months? It's scary. It's sad. I feel angry. We should have been listening to the doctors and the scientists. Um, uh, we should not have been listening to um, people talking about the stock market. It's natural that people are reaching for answers, for someone to be accountable after scenes like mass graves being dug in New York and refrigerated trucks lining up to receive the dead once the morgues were full. If the Lord says so, I'll see you Saturday. <laughs> we now know that African Americans, like Rhoda Hatch, are still dying in disproportionate numbers. I think 100,000 is an extraordinary uh, number 
it means that there's a lot of pain and grief. But some of us in the black community are very concerned that as the narrative became that African Americans were disproportionately impacted by the virus, that there was also then a push to open up the country that many of us think, you know, prematurely, that again suggests the devaluation of black life. Those calls to reopen go on, even as the number of dead continues to mount and as the nation mourns. Well, flags have most recently been lowered here after tragedies like mass shootings, and even then, it's been difficult to grapple with the scale of loss after sometimes dozens of people have been killed. But how then does America even begin to count the emotional cost of such a staggering number of deaths? To really do justice to the stories of those lost would take many lifetimes. For people left behind, the question lingers. Could more have been done so these Americans and tens of thousands of others might still be around? Aline McBall, BBC News in Washington. And I can talk now to Frank Langford, who's a correspondent at NPR, US National Public Radio, who joins me now from Weybridge. Uh, Frank, thank you uh, for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, an incredibly grim tally to be talking about. 100,000 deaths. Uh, one report has the uh, virus infection rate still going up in uh, approximately 20 states. What has been the, the public reaction to news of this figure being passed? I, I think it's a huge milestone for the country, and I think it's, it has a big impact. You know, the United States, which before this happened, uh, people in the United States thought that the country was prepared for this sort of thing. Clearly, it was not. And to be not only the country that suffered the most deaths but has crossed this incredible threshold, I, th I think it has people reassessing um, the, the country's effectiveness at dealing with these sorts of things. The United States is normally very good at dealing with uh, these kinds of disasters and problems. And so I think it's really shaken people all over the country. Uh, this is clearly a public health emergency. It's also a, a political emergency in some countries, depending on how the public view uh, a particular government, a particular leader has handled the situation. Clearly, it's a pressing one for Donald Trump uh, up for re-election, he hopes, in November. And he himself has been talking about this pandemic in terms of his election. He has, he has created that narrative. I mean, how do you think... Uh, his handling of the pandemic and this death toll, and it's still on the rise, affects his chances for a second term. I think it will be front and centre in the, in the final five months of this election race, as, un, as unusual as it, as it is, because obviously Joe Biden has hardly been able to go out and the president hasn't gone out much. But I think that as we get close to November, the big question for people is going to be just what you heard in that earlier report is what more could have been done. Um, there are reports uh, out of the United States that say, even if the country had locked down a, a bit earlier, a week or two earlier, it could have saved maybe tens of thousands of lives. And I think that the, President Trump is going to have to contend with that. The other question is going to be, where's the economy uh, as we move into October and November? And how, at an individual level, do people experience this? Do they know people who have died? Are they out of work as they prepare to go to the ballot box? That's going to be crucial to President Trump's chances to be reelected. Uh, and President Trump has been, uh, you know, repeating the line, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. He's clearly very focused on the economy. But, you know, if you look back a few weeks, he was talking about the economy opening up at, at Easter again. Clearly, that didn't happen. It was much, much too early. Um, so do you think uh, in the remaining months between now and November that we are going to see perhaps more so than ever before, a really bitterly fought campaign, um, you know, with, with lots of blame being flung around. I think so. And I think if, you, if you're on the Democratic side, you know the kinds of commercials you're going to run because Donald Trump, because he's out there so much since January, first, you know, for a long time downplaying this. Now it's 100,000 dead, over 40 million Americans out of work. You can just imagine uh, it's very easy to figure out what kind of campaign that the Democrats will run against him. Uh, he will push to get the economy into recovery as soon as possible, and that could help him. On the other hand, you know, even though we've seen good things out of the stock market, the stock market is not the American economy, and it takes a long time for jobs to come back after such a deep recession like this. Um, so I think anybody else, honestly, at this point, any other candidate incumbent, uh, it would be very hard to imagine they could win a, a re-election. On the other hand, 
Donald Trump, as he's proved over and over again, is a unique president in modern American history. Yes, and clearly some of his supporters are, you know, utterly devoted to him. They absolutely, absolutely believe in this, you know, make America great again slogan. But, you know, with, with the... With the economy in trouble, as economies around the world are in the wake of this pandemic and still during this pandemic, um, you know, for, for those voters who might be persuaded to change their minds, uh, you know, how much is this pandemic going to, to shift thinking away from Donald Trump and towards Joe Biden? I think that's it's a great question, Anita. I think there are very few people for these two men to fight over. Most Americans know Donald Trump very, very well. And I think it is going to come down to the economy and to personal experience with this pandemic. Uh, if, if Joe Biden is going to win every, any other people over, it's going to be because people have lost faith. His supporters have lost faith in him, uh, Donald Trump, bringing back the economy, or because they know people who've lost their lives and they feel the president deserves some responsibility for that. OK, Frank, uh, good to talk to you. Frank Langford, correspondent at uh, National Public Radio, uh, US National Public Radio. Thank you very much. EasyJet says it is planning to cut 4,500 jobs and shrink its fleet as a result of the coronavirus. The airline says the reductions will fit the smaller market it, it expects to emerge from the collapse in air travel due to COVID-19. EasyJet employs more than 15,000 people in eight countries across Europe. Uh, well, other airlines have already announced job cuts and restructuring programmes as they fight to stay in business. These include British Airways, which is set to cut up to 12,000 jobs from its 42,000 strong workforce. Uh, the airline's parent company, IAG, said it needed to impose a restructuring and redundancy programme. Also, Ryanair, which is set to cut 3,000 jobs, 15% of its workforce, Boss Michael O'Leary saying the move was the minimum needed just to survive the next 12 months. And Virgin Atlantic announced plans to cut more than 3,000 jobs in the UK out of a total of 10,000 and to end its operation at Gatwick Airport. Meanwhile, the Japanese car firm Nissan has announced the closure of its factory in Barcelona with a loss of almost 3,000 jobs. The Spanish government said the move was part of a new worldwide three-year restructuring plan. Nissan says its plant in Sunderland in the UK will remain open as a production base. Well, here to talk uh, about all of this is our business correspondent, Ben Thompson. Um, ben, let's, let's begin with EasyJet, first of all. Uh, you know, clearly looking at all those other airlines, it's no surprise that we were going to be hearing about restructuring from, from EasyJet as well. Tell us more. Yes, you're absolutely right. No huge surprise, but maybe the scale of the job cuts announced this morning will worry many. Uh, we've already had reaction, as you'd expect, from the unions. Uh, Balpa, that's the pilots' union, calling it a, an unnecessary knee-jerk reaction. They say that demand will pick back up and EasyJet is acting too quickly. Uh, we've also heard from Unite. Uh, it says it's unnecessarily hasty. But if you look at the detail that we've had from EasyJet today, they talk about demand not getting back to levels, the levels of before this crisis, until at least 2023. And so for airlines that have a lot of costs associated with just keeping their planes on the ground, uh, they're having to come up with ways to keep their costs down. A large proportion of that, of course, will be labour costs, their staff uh, and so they've said they will cut 30% of the workforce. And given that it employs about 15,000 people, we expect that to be about 4,500 roles. And you talk there about all other airlines right around the world having to think about new ways of doing business because airlines operate with very small profit margins in many cases. They rely on seats being full to keep those planes profitable. And, of course, with concern about things like social distancing, even when restrictions are lifted, I think there is a fear that people will not return to the travel habits they had before and that could have a longer term impact on airlines and the ability of airlines to make money when those planes do finally start flying again and remember EasyJet like many others has grounded its entire fleet since March and so now it's starting to look at how it can resume flights but quite crucially how it can make some money from the flights that it does operate. Uh, ben, let's talk then about uh, Nissan also using that restructuring word. What's the thinking behind the decision to close uh, the Barcelona plant? But, but uh, what's the news then for Sunderland here in the UK? 
Yes, uh, an expected update from Nissan today talking about their three-year turnaround plan because there are so many factors at play as far as Nissan is concerned. Not least that sales were falling pretty sharply even before the coronavirus outbreak. Their sales were down about 14%. They were on track to make their first loss in 11 years and so the boss has been outlining plans for how they will return to profitability and remember this is a global car giant so clearly based in Japan big operations in China but also in Europe North America and Latin America and what we've heard from Nissan this morning is that it's going to have to close the Barcelona factory with a loss of 2,800 jobs. It says to try and shift some production elsewhere because it says at the moment it's got the capacity around the world to make 7 million vehicles when actually it only needs the capacity to make 5 million vehicles. So it's going to cut its production by 20%, cut the number of models that it makes, car models, van models, by 20% as well. We expect from about 69 down to about 55 models to streamline its production. And interestingly, Nissan says its focus will be on Japan China and the United States. Europe not getting a look in as far as that is concerned. But this is when it gets interesting because Nissan has a tie up with the French car giant Renault. And we're expecting to hear more details when we hear from Renault next week about where they will focus their production. And it could emerge that Nissan is more dominant perhaps in China, Japan and North America and Renault will take the lead in Europe and that's where the Sunderland plant comes into this. Currently one of its biggest sites, um, they su there is a suggestion that the production that is lost in Barcelona may move to the Sunderland plant. So uh, at the moment employing 2,800 people there, 20, um, uh, sorry, um, 350,000 vehicles uh, that it makes at that site uh, every year. So we could perhaps see an increase in production if some of that is moved from the plant in Barcelona, but clearly no details yet about what role Renault will play in all of that. And crucially about jobs, there is some speculation that that site will move from three shifts to two, uh, but we may get further details about that site when we hear from Renault a little later. But the glimmer of hope in all of this for those workers who are at the Sunderland plant in the northeast of England is that they've committed to that site of being a production base and one that they will maintain Sunderland as a production base for the company. So some hope there, despite those job cuts that have been announced in Barcelona. OK, Ben, thank you very much. Ben Thompson our business correspondent. Uh, let's take a look at the latest headlines now. Test and trace systems get underway in England and Scotland today as part of a more targeted approach to tackling coronavirus. Scientists say it's not a magic bullet, but government ministers hope it will allow lockdown restrictions to be eased across the UK. Beijing overwhelmingly endorses a hugely controversial bill that paves the way for a tough new security law in Hong Kong. This is a major move to practice one country, two systems, and is also in line with China's constitution and the basic law of Hong Kong. The number of people who've died with COVID-19 in the United States has now passed 100,000. South Korea is reimposing some social restrictions in its main cities to combat a small spike in coronavirus cases there. And Nissan has announced the closure of its factory in Barcelona with the loss of almost 3,000 jobs. However, its Sunderland production plant in the UK will remain open. Large protests have broken out in America after the death of an unarmed black man in police custody. President Trump says he's asked the FBI and the Department of Justice to investigate the incident. George Floyd died in Minneapolis. He'd been arrested and pinned down in the street with an officer kneeling on his neck. Four officers have been sacked. And a warning, there are some images you may find distressing in this report from David Willis. Racial fault lines laying bare once again in a nation at the epicenter of the COVID pandemic. Protesters clashed with police in the city of Minneapolis and looting broke out as calls grew for justice following the death of another unarmed black man at the hands of white police officers. Cell phone video of the arrest of George Floyd shows him handcuffed and pleading for air. I cannot breathe. As an officer presses his knee on the back of Mr. Floyd's neck, he eventually loses consciousness and was then taken to hospital where he was pronounced dead. 
Police originally said he was resisting arrest, but security camera footage provided no evidence of that. During a visit to NASA's Kennedy Space Center, President Trump gave his reaction to George Floyd's death. A very, very sad, sad event. Day. 46-year-old George Floyd was arrested on suspicion of trying to pass off a counterfeit check. Four of the police officers involved in his arrest have since been fired, but there are now growing calls for them to face criminal charges. Well, I'm calling on Hennepin County Attorney Mike Freeman to act on the evidence before him. I'm calling on him to charge the arresting officer in this case. A demonstration in support of George Floyd in Los Angeles also turned violent. Police cars were attacked and one of the city's main freeways was blocked for a time by protesters. In Minneapolis, a city with a police force that has long been criticized for tolerating racism, feelings are running high. George Floyd's death has prompted comparison with previous killings in other parts of the country involving black suspects and white police officers, a problem this country cannot seem to shake off. David Willis, BBC News, Los Angeles. Most children across the UK haven't stepped foot in a school for more than two months. For some of them, it's been a welcome break, but for others, the pandemic has affected their confidence and their mental well-being. With some pupils in England due to return to the classroom as early as next week, the Children's Commissioner is now calling for a mental health counsellor in every school. Seema Katecha reports. Sunshine and cricket. But lockdown hasn't always been like this. For 10-year-old Uman, the youngest of three brothers, it's led to anxiety and distress. On one occasion, he had what felt like a panic attack. I was very tense inside. It was very hard because I was thinking about what was going to happen next, where I'm going to, like, what is anything going to happen between the family? I couldn't do it anymore, so I just wanted to go out and just let it all out, but I couldn't. His mum's worried about the impact it will have on his long-term mental health. Exactly. Trying to support him now and in the future, we don't know how this is going to impact him. The constant question of when will it end? What if it comes back? What if one of us gets it? What if we die? Um, it's quite a lot for a 10-year-old. A survey by one charity suggests 67% of parents and carers are also concerned about the mental health impact the coronavirus outbreak will have on their children, with many noticing an increase in depression and anxiety. The Children's Commissioner for England wants schools to be at the forefront of providing mental health support. So what I'm calling for is a mental health counsellor in every school to help children recover from the COVID emergency and help them gain the confidence and resilience they need to move forward and make the most of their education and their childhood, which has been on hold for so many weeks. But at a time when the country is facing a recession and there's likely to be tighter budgets, there's doubt over whether this idea is financially viable. The government says it recognises the importance of mental health during this time. In a statement, it says, that is why we have published guidance for schools and families about how to support their children's mental well-being and education at home. It says we have also placed significance on mental health and well-being in our planning framework for the wider opening of schools. Coronavirus has affected the lives of all of us. Its impact on the minds of the youngest in society might only be properly understood in years to come. Seema Katecha, BBC News. South Korea is reintroducing tougher social distancing measures after officials there recorded a fresh spike in coronavirus infections. 79 new cases were identified on Thursday. That's the highest daily figure for nearly two months. Hundreds of schools have switched back to online classes in response. The BBC's Seoul correspondent Laura Bicker explains what has led to the current situation. The eyes of the world have been on South Korea as a role model to test, to track, 
to trace every case when it comes to this pandemic and they have so far been successful and remain so. However, however hard they try, these cases keep cropping up around the country. The latest is at a distribution warehouse. It's a huge company called Kupang that sends out uh, basically e-commerce right across the country. So far, 79 cases, as you said, the highest number of cases in two months. So today, health ministers within the last hour have made an urgent plea to try to maintain some kind of distancing measures. Now, they say they're not going to step up the social distancing measures, but what they're asking people to do is stay away from mass gatherings, to look at wearing masks where possible. And also, they're kind of closing public parks, museums, they're urging businesses to kind of maintain working from home or flexible working hours. It's not, they say, a step backwards in social distancing measures. They are calling for a concerted effort for two weeks to try to get schools to maintain opening time. So basically they've had this phased reopen. Yesterday, two and a half million children went back. Next week, more are due to go back. They want the education system to remain open if possible. And that is the plea that's going out to the people. Stay apart where possible. Maintain these measures and allow the children to go back to school. The real worry here is these cases are close to metropolitan areas like here in Seoul, which have so far avoided mass outbreaks of COVID-19. They are worried it could spread quickly if it takes hold within the city. And that is why the concern is so high right now. It's not a step backwards, they're saying, but they are trying to push people to maintain some kind of vigilance. Laura Bicker reporting from Seoul. A British charity dealing with forced marriages says it's seen an increase in the number of young people asking for help since lockdown began in March. Karma Nirvana, which provides support for people who are facing physical and emotional abuse from relatives, has told BBC Asian Network it's currently dealing with 116 new cases where women are being threatened with forced marriage or are trying to escape one. Sheetal Palmer reports. The hidden victims of lockdown. Young people not going to school, college or work are now at risk of a forced marriage. One of them is Jasmine, who's in her early 20s and who fled her family home after threats were made to her life. Since the beginning of lockdown, um, I've had all my human rights taken away from me, like by my family members, my mother, my father and my siblings. Jasmine, whose name we've changed, left her home early one morning fearing for her safety. My mother has threatened to burn my skin, burn my body, if I neglected the prayer. And she said it to my face, wait till lockdown is over, you are getting married. During the lockdown, we've had increases by up to 200% to our helpline. The charity Karma Nirvana says they're dealing with 116 people who've asked for help over a forced marriage during the last two months of lockdown. What we need to recognise about honour-based abuse is that it's one of Britain's worst kept secrets. It's not a cultural issue, it's abuse. And victims need to be empowered to know that they can come forward. And likewise, professionals need to be empowered to recognise the issues so that they respond appropriately when victims do come forward. Forced marriage has been illegal since 2014, but there have only been two convictions in that time and very few prosecutions. While the problem is suppressed during lockdown, the authorities fear there could be a spike in cases when restrictions are lifted. While lockdown permits this sort of behaviour and it enables it, um, young people are isolated in their homes with their families without their usual support mechanisms. And um, families who are intent in um, arranging for or forcing marriages, particularly with family who are living abroad, can easily do so online. Zara, which isn't her real name, is a teenager who wrote to me about her lockdown ordeal while schools are closed. They're on WhatsApp to her family in Pakistan all the time, looking at pictures of men for me to marry. My brother sticks with my dad and my mum is just too scared to say anything. Charities and some experts who worked on the original forced marriage law are calling for specialist services to have ring-fenced funding during the lockdown if they're going to help with multiple victims in the months to come. But that may not come easily. Sheetal Palmer, 
BBC News. The headlines now on BBC News. Test and trace systems get underway in England and Scotland today as part of a more targeted approach to tackling coronavirus. Beijing overwhelmingly endorses a hugely controversial bill that paves the way for a tough new security law in Hong Kong. And the number of people who've died with COVID-19 in the United States has now passed 100,000. And let's get more on that headline now, because more than 100,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the United States, by some distance the highest number in the world. Of the more than 5.6 million confirmed cases of the virus around the world, 1.7 million have been in the United States. Well, let's take a look at how the US got to this point. The first death was reported on February the 29th. On March the 13th, President Trump declared a national emergency as schools were closed. Stay-at-home orders were issued in California, New York and Washington. By then, 40 people had died. Within a month, the U.S. passed Italy's death toll with uh, just over 20,000 uh, people dying from COVID-19, making it the highest number of deaths recorded in the world. Just four days later, the death toll was above 30,000. President Trump released his guidelines for reopening the country as anti-lockdown protests broke out. Into May, and the president said his coronavirus task force would continue indefinitely uh, 24 hours after announcing it would close. At that point, the death toll stood at 71,000. And uh, now, just three months on from the first death, 100,000 deaths officially in the United States from COVID-19. Joining me now are uh, Dr. Peter Drobak, who is a global health physician and an expert in infectious diseases, and also Jan Halper-Hayes, uh, a, a Republican commentator. Uh, thank you both very much for your time today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Drobak, to you first of all. Uh, obviously, there are different measures by which we can compare various countries and their response to this pandemic. But how do you assess uh, the death rate in the US and the response of the U.S. government. Well, yesterday, of course, was a, a very grim milestone in the U.S. with 100,000 deaths. And, you know, the, the country has 4 percent of the world's population, but nearly 30 percent of the COVID-19 deaths worldwide have occurred in the U.S. And, of, of course, this is nothing short of a, a, of a tragedy. There are a number of reasons, I think, why things have gotten to where they've gotten early on. I think um, uh, what happened was there was a very slow response. So once we all learned about this virus and the virus was sequenced and we began to see how quickly it was spreading, um, the countries that did well began preparing as early as January. Um, the U.S. really lost time those early months um, through a kind of sense of complacency and overconfidence and didn't do a lot of planning. There were also some technical mishaps with testing um, that really set things back. Uh, but then as things continue to spread, I think uh, slow to act in terms of uh, more extreme social distancing. And, and what's really continued to be an issue, I think, has been the lack of a, uh, a really coordinated national plan for how to address the pandemic um, in a coordinated response in, in, in this kind of uh, uh, a, a, uh, approach of letting states go it alone uh, has been very difficult. Oh, oh, okay, Peter, let's uh, put what you were saying to, to Jan. Uh, a, a tragic death toll, 100,000 souls, and, and, and you know, uh, according to some estimates, the, the virus, cases of the virus still going up in as many as, as 20 states. Uh, in the early days of this, President Trump said the coronavirus is very much under control in the USA when clearly, you know, it, it, it wasn't. I think by any reasonable estimate, one can say that the U.S. was slow to act, wasn't it? Hence the death toll. Well, you know, I'm not willing to criticize whether it's Boris Johnson or uh, Donald Trump, because this was something that not a single country, not a single medical person, not a single expert in infectious diseases had ever dealt with. And I think that we are, when you compare the U.S. to other countries, it's unrealistic. The U.K. fits into the U.S. 40 times. France is smaller than the state of Texas. Why, when Italy is about the size of California, that California had less than 3,000 deaths, but yet um, they have a population that is two-thirds of New York, and New York had 
basically almost the same amount of deaths as Italy. But so on the point of uh, the speed of reaction, if you look at the response times, this was some work that the BBC has done, if you look at the response times of countries uh, in terms of introducing lockdowns after they had reached the point of one death per million residents because of, of COVID-19, Germany and France locked down within a couple of days. Italy, uh, higher death toll within six days. I mean, the US... Uh, still hasn't a, got a nationwide lockdown, has it? So clearly that is a factor, isn't it? Well, how can you compare 50 different states to those small countries? And so I, I just cannot agree with you on that. The fact remains that you have to look at how each of the governors are making decisions. You have to look at how Fauci who has been the medical advisor, has gone back and forth seesawing on advice. Donald Trump closed the country at the end of January. Why don't we look at how the World Health Organization told well, us still in February that it could not be human to, transferred human to human. Well, well, well let's, mean, we let's talk then about the public health message and the importance of setting the tone, which is obviously something we've been talking about in the UK a lot in the last few days. Uh, Peter Drobak, um, how much do you think the tone set by uh, President Trump has been key to the response in the United States, the reaction of the public in the United States, and, and ultimately, I suppose, the death toll? Well, you know, the measures that need to be taken to control a pandemic, things like social distancing, are acts of sacrifice that individuals have to make on behalf of the greater good. And so these are really acts of, of, of solidarity. And so one of the most important uh, parts about leadership in a pandemic and crisis is to develop that sense of shared mission and purpose, to communicate clearly um, and uh, with an evidence base in a scientific way, uh, and to bring people together. Unfortunately, that a lot of the messaging that we've seen Seen, um, has uh, has been a bit more uh, confused, has been in sometimes in contrast with the evidence. And, and unfortunately, we've seen some elements of the pandemic response become politicized in the U.S., and that's a very dangerous place because we really need to be coming together to beat this thing. Well, that's, that's a really good point to come back to you on, on Jan. Uh, the message has become highly politicized in the U.S. at a time when perhaps, you know, arguably we should be taking politics out of this and, and judging this not on whether you support the Republicans or the Democrats, but you know, purely on how the president has handled this unprecedented challenge, uh, you know, for the whole of the USA. Um, you know, he talked about infamously drinking bleach. He said that church pews, he hoped people would be back in churches at Easter, not because of any data, because he thought it would be a beautiful timeline. You know, uh, many people will be asking, when is the president going to get a grip of this crisis and that it's too late already, in fact? Well, why do you focus on some of the things that he said and you don't focus on some of the things that he did? Also, New York, of the 100,000, New York had 20% of those deaths. So, again, the fact that you blanket the U.S. against other countries. Now, I understand that there was great criticism when Trump said, look, Part of my role is to be a cheerleader. And sometimes he doesn't actually communicate as well as he could. But if we are really going to look at this, do we want to condemn any of them? I mean, how about Fauci and Burks? They were the two medical advisors, and they did not tell us to wear masks, and now they're telling us to wear masks. You have to look at all the inconsistencies, or another way to look at it okay. is what was done initially, what didn't work, what changes were made, what then worked, and what do we need to do to create a benchmark to prepare for the future? J I Jan, think to uh, just criticize is ridiculous. It's not intelligent. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your thoughts today, Dr. Jan Halperhays and Dr. Uh, Peter Drobak as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bad weather has delayed the launch of the first privately funded mission to the International Space Station. Uh, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket funded by Tesla owner Elon Musk was halted 17 minutes before takeoff because of thunderstorms. The next available window for a new attempt is on Saturday. 
Now, a perfectly preserved ancient Roman mosaic floor has been discovered under an Italian vineyard. After decades of searching, experts in Verona finally unearthed the well-preserved tiles buried under tons of earth. Uh, isn't it absolutely beautiful? Uh, apparently, scholars first found evidence of a Roman villa there more than a century ago. Archaeologists are still excavating the site to see the full extent of the ancient building. Decades in the making, but absolutely beautiful there in Verona. Uh, we are now going to say goodbye to viewers on BBC World. Thanks for watching. You're watching BBC News.